Hello, uh, yes, welcome, welcome. I do care if it's sunny or if it's raining where you are. I, that, I don't know why I said that. Uh, my name is Jason Schwab. I'm a producer at Restaurant Spaces and this is Disrupt. Disrupt is our little LinkedIn live show that we do once a week. Uh, it's just 20 minutes long, just enough for you to wolf down some leftover food from your dinner last night. That is your lunch today. And what do we do on Disrupt? We just have a, a little chat with someone in the industry, someone who is doing something cool in the restaurant business, someone who is thinking in an interesting way about what's ahead for the restaurant industry. And uh, maybe in watching this, you might walk away with some idea or way of doing things that gets you to change your perspective on how you do your thing. Um, that was a long-winded explanation. Let's just jump straight into it today. It is episode six, and our guest today is someone called Bippin Patel. Bippin is the Senior Director of Design and Architecture at CKE Restaurants, which of course is Hardy's and Carl's Jr. And uh, really interesting to have Bippin on today. CKE is right smack bang in the middle of completely re-envisioning what their restaurants are going to be look, look, looking like into the future. And uh, at the moment, they're in a pretty hefty data collection process that they're just at the beginning of, and they're coming up with some prototypes, which they're going to be uh, unveiling to sort of handle the change in custo uh, customer behaviors. So really looking forward to talking about that today. And um, Bippin, Bippin's just a, a really switched on and intelligent person. Uh, we had him uh, participate in some of our digital roundtables, our mastermind series earlier this year, and he just seems to be one of those people, he says something at you or to you and you think, why aren't I thinking about that already? Why aren't I doing that thing already? Um, anyway, enough blabbering from me. Let's just bring him on so he can do that to you right now. Bippin, hello, hello. Welcome to Disrupt. How are you hey, doing? Jason, how are you? Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm doing really well. I, I gave you a bit of a, an explanation there about, about how you are, so you've got to live up to some expectations. Yeah, that was too kind. Uh, you know, you're, you're uh, putting me at a, uh, on a pedestal here, but I'll do my best. Yeah, no, I, I'm sure you do a great job. And um, Bippin, look, look we'll, just, we'll just jump straight into it. Um, you know, you've been at CKE now since I think around 2018, unless I'm wrong. and. I was just wondering if, you know, can you give us a bit of a, a rundown, you know, what, what are you doing there? What are you focused on right now? And I'm just going to give you about 42 seconds to explain that. Yeah, no, I've been with CKE now for three years. I uh, uh, was brought on to help kind of transform the brand from the brand position standpoint, really connect our brand positioning as our, as our, as our assets. Our assets are, you know, about 40, 60 years old. They're getting a little tired. Uh, they haven't maintained a relevancy in the past. So we're going to bridge that gap and bring it to kind of a 21st century. And it's not just the, you know, the asset look and feel, but it's a kind of an end-to-end -end kind of solutions from menu innovation, uh, uh, you know, beverage innovation, um, technology innovation, operational efficiency and innovation. So bring it together in a holistic manner that provides us with the consumer's state of needs from end-to-end -end solution. So exciting things going on. And I think that was exactly 42 seconds. I, I don't know why I, I do that with people. It, <laughs> we're we're, we're going to have some time to jump into that a bit further now, uh, Bippin. Thanks for the explanation. Um, let's let's dive into that. So that work you're doing right now. So uh, give us a bit of background. It's, it's really just a, a, a real ground up kind of reimagining of what your restaurants are going to look like. So how did this undertaking come to be? How long have you been at it now for? And, and what prompted it in the first place? Yeah, I think, you know, it's funny. Um, the, uh, the whole process, we actually started back in 2019, believe it or not, before the COVID kind of came to us, right? Um, forward thinking and just understanding where the business and the st consumer state of needs were and how they were changing over the last three years before that. So before we were seeing about 2% decline of uh, customers coming in and dining and experiencing a brand. You know, we're heavily focused on the drive-through, but we saw that kind of decline year over year uh, by 2%. It means that less customers were coming in and they were using us differently and off-premise was kind of increasing at the same time. So more drive-through, more third-party delivery, more, you know, order through your technology or your plat uh, uh, digital platform and come pick it up. So the consumer state were, states were, uh, state of needs were changing. So that's how we kind of started that journey itself. Um, and at the time, 
uh, the, uh, the initiative was put on hold because of the other kind of pressing initiatives. But when COVID hit us, you know, we, the leadership came back and said, hey, you know what? You know what you were working on last year? How can we accelerate that very quickly? Because that's where we need to be tomorrow, right? So it kind of pivoted very quickly. So it just brought all those things that we were working on a year ago to the center stage and push the boundaries even further to get this thing stood up uh, by end of this year. Really interesting. And, and I want to come back to uh, just organizationally how, how you're doing that a little later on. But so, so can you just explain to us where you are right now? So at the moment, you're, you're at the beginning of this comprehensive data collection process, right? Um, I'd like you to talk us through that in just a bit, but I just want to say to anyone who is watching out there, uh, if you have any questions about this project or anything you'd like us to throw at Bippin, throw them up in the comments area just here to the right and, and we'll get to them later on. But with, with this data collection piece, Bippin, uh, you know, how exactly are you doing that? What kind of things are you collecting right now? And uh, I guess, what, what are you finding out so far? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the challenges that we have is we don't have a good uh, historical data on some of our kind of you know core business needs and such right from technology and operations and such so we're kind of bridging that gap but understanding kind of sales performance uh, to the level of day parting uh, you know specific to the sites itself you know based on our two of our brands because they're very different Hardy's is very much about breakfast Carl's is much very much about burgers and and uh, afternoon and dinner and, and uh, uh, evening day parts and such. So we need to collect that and to understand that and come up with a solution that is more flexible model. Before it was all kind of one size fits all mentality. Didn't matter what size parcel it was, didn't matter you know what my business state of needs were, we always build the same type of building design based on the previous prototypes. Now we're thinking a little more differently about optimization based on real estate attributes, based on demographics, who your core, core customers are. And, and provide more of a flexible omni channels, right? So some units could be looked at as, hey, I need 60 seats here, or it's heavily uh, drive-through business or off-premise business that we might pivot. So 60 seat option, 40 seat options, 20 seat options, and even all off-premise with no kind of interior seats and it's walk up, uh, maybe some patio, uh, outdoor gathering space, uh, but really looking at it in a different mindset altogether based on, again, scalability of real estate, investment, all those kind of uh, 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 business omnichannel needs. Okay, okay. And, and to, are you partnering with any uh, companies in particular to sort of compile all this information at the moment? Can you, can you sort of say? Um, well, I, I, I know our uh, real estate team, teaming is working on some of that. Uh, from the design standpoint, you know, we've partnered with Livid. I know Benjamin was on the, uh, one of the sessions, you know, maybe three, three uh, weeks ago or so. Uh, they've been a great kind of partners for, with us as well, WD on a kind of a rollout execution stand side of it. So we're doing kind of uh, collecting data off even our back of the house efficiencies, right? Is that equipment today relevant from what it was two, 20 years ago? Is it doing the job you need to do from the speed of service standpoint to support the customer's state of needs, right? So we're doing back of the house kind of uh, observation, uh, time and motion studies, and really thinking differently from the back of the house. How do we optimize that, right? How do we be more efficient from that standpoint? So 40 years ago, it worked great. 30 years ago, great. But not in today's environment, right? Because that constant state of need is changing and we need to adapt with that as well. So those are some of the, just a few examples of partners that we're working with. Okay, great. Great. And I mean, have you found any insights so far, specifically with your back of house tinkering there that uh, you can share? Or is it, this is, this is all still early, early in the yeah, game? Yeah, I think from our uh, initial observation, we know some of the uh, the previous um, prototype designs were not efficient. We, we know that already, but we'll get into the details once we're done with the observations. It just got started here in uh, national market for Hardee's last week, and we're going to be doing the same thing at Carl's. So it's still kind of fresh and, and uh, not there yet. Uh, and there'll be more to come down the road when we're when you have everything collected, sorted through, and then we know exactly what we're dealing with. Great. Okay. Now, Bibin, you mentioned that those prototypes just before, you know, you've got a 50 seater and a, I think a 30 seater you said, and, and then a, a digital sort of first concept that has no seating whatsoever. How do you imagine these are going to fit into the portfolio moving forward? Obviously this is kind of like a, a kit of parts or uh, that you can sort of choose from depending on what geography you're heading into and the demographics and that kind of thing. So how do you envision that's going to be playing out? Uh, once you start rolling these out? Yeah, no, that's ex exactly the case, right? We want to develop um, like a ven ven uh, venues for our real estate uh, and operations um, perspective. So if it's a size of a parcel, if it's urban environment versus light urban versus residential. So we're going to look at where we specifically um, from the standpoint of understanding, you know, who are core, as you just mentioned, core demographic, you know, the demographics, 
who's your core customer to the level degree? What challenges do we think we have to overcome and such? Uh, what are the sales channels that we're trying to solve for? If it's heavily drive through, that means we may not need as many seats, right? From Carl's, it changes to the Hardee's because Hardee's is very much about breakfast uh, driven day parts and such. So that's the scalability we're going to put into play. So some of these things may not be everywhere, right? It could be based on certain marketplace. Are we doing a deeper penetrations based on existing units? Uh, we have a unit, let's say, for example, that is about eight miles away, but we can't build the same size as we previously did because of cannibalizations and such. But can we offset that by doing a smaller building um, to kind of offset that segment of, you know, um, cannibalization to that standpoint? So both of them are kind of healthy and sustainable on its own without one feeling kind of a burden over the other one because of the investment costs and occupancy costs and all things considered. So that's how we're going to look at it from a real estate perspective that meets the state of need. Okay, interesting. And, and I'm also curious too, Bipin, you know, you're, you're in the midst of collecting uh, all this information and, you know, we're coming off the back of this really crazy period where, you know, nothing has made sense and that's kind of skewing to the situation now. So I guess, you know, how are you kind of discerning what to pull the trigger on? You know, is this just a, an after effect of COVID or a flow on effect from COVID and the pandemic? How do you, how how are you guys supposed to know in, in restaurant development and design what you need to be doing and and you know uh, you know how how is the customer going to be after this and what are you basing these decisions off? Yeah, I think it's always we got to start with the customer in mind first and foremost, right? So even as we're looking at designing our forward concepts, prototypes, if you want to call them, it's not designed for the sake of design, right? That's not all that's going to bring customers into our restaurants. It's about great food great service. And I always look at the decor, the outside and inside is a background for a customer to kind of enjoy the, you know, the great food that we have and the great service that we have. That's what it comes down to. So pivoting from uh, COVID last year, um, you know, the good thing about our business is because we also have drive through right? So even our dining rooms were closed, we were able to uh, take the benefits of the drive through and we saw actually positive, uh, you know, comms growth for, for both of the brands, especially for the Hardee's. When, where we were able to keep the drive through open and, uh, and, and divert our customers from inside to the outside uh, from that thinking itself. So that benefited us from, uh, greatly. You know, we even looked at doing a, a drive through 2.0, which was heavily focused on the exterior uh, re-imaging upgrades, right? To make sure that curb appeal, technology, menu, you know, menu boards and digital menu boards, all things were brought into conversations. Uh, and then whatever we do as part of the prototype, you know, the challenge will be is like, how do we take that and, and, and roll it into our existing portfolio? So we're looking at it as a phased approach to how our re-imaging program is going to look like, because we have, as I mentioned, you know, units that are 30, 40 years old in the system that are feel a little dated. So how do we bring that relevant relevance into it? And we're a little behind in our kind of remodel or re-imaging programs, you know, two cycles. So we're going to see a hefty kind of investment that's needed to to lift the the market and the image up at the same same time. So we're kind of approaching in a phase approach. Like phase one is going to be curb appeal, exterior. Uh, look and feel, digital experience, and just freshening that up because that's what our customers' first impressions is really experienced by, right, before they even come inside. So that's where our main focus is to look at that and get that entire system kind of phase one done in the next two years and then follow up another two years to get the interior remodeled images based on what we're doing with the rest of the future, bring that into conversations. So we have this four-year cycle of getting the remodel re-imaging stood up, uh, you know, within the 2,000 units that we have system-wide. Right. Okay. Thanks for outlining that. And 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 just on that, so your phased approach. Then um, I know you are working on a prototype, a prototype at the moment, which you hope to have up and running by around mid November, I think. So I just want to bring up some images, Laura. If you could just bring up some images of that right now, um, can you talk us through uh, what we're looking at here, Bip, and how does this fit into that phased approach? And this is kind of like a, I guess, for lack of a better of a term, this is like the prototype for the prototypes to come, right? Yeah, this is more about the rest of the future, right? So this is an actual site that we have here in uh, Nashville area itself. We'll be open here in mid-November. Uh, we're in the permitting process right now, and we hope to break ground here uh, in, by middle of August, I believe. But again, it goes back to the point about really focusing on off-premise. And the way the building is designed is kind of reversed. The front of the building, which is more heavily focused for off-premise kind of delivery drivers and, and to-go orders and such, so historically, the way we position the building is that the dining rooms will be on the front of the side of the building. But here we're trying to kind of help uh, mitigate some of that kind of uh, bottleneck occurring in the traffic that's flowing. So it's kind of reversed. The dining room is actually now on the back side 
and we've incorporated uh, outdoor patio, the dining rooms a little more smaller. And this is kind of a scalable model, right? So if, I, if somebody needs, let's say, you know, this unit has 40 seats, but if they need 60 seats, then all they have to do is kind of stretch that dining room out. Or if they need more patio seats, you know, it's stretch that out as well. So it's a modular approach, approach to it. But heavily focused again is really on the off-premise uh, third-party delivery. We have walk-up uh, abilities. We have third-party delivery where they could just go into this vestibule and get their product and such. We have QR um, ordering process at the curbside pickup zones uh, in, 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 in that mindset. So it's really thinking differently and just flipping the building entirely and trying to solve the consumer state of need and who are the, the future customers going to be from that standpoint outside of our legacy customers, which will come back to us over and over again. But the idea is to attract new customer base the either that has fallen out of love with the brand um, or new customer base that just hasn't experienced a brand because they didn't feel the way we were relevant. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so, so when you have this up and running, how is that then going to feed into the future, those, those other concepts that you mentioned before? Are you are going to then use this to collect more information and then make kind of iterative processes, uh, changes on those, on those concepts? Absolutely. I mean, this is somewhat, you know, new thinking for us as well. So this is not one and done. We're going to learn as much as we can, spend a lot of time with operations team and brand team from that standpoint, you know, the next three months or so and learn, you know, what's working and what's not working. And then how do we adapt and iterate to the next project and such. And typically it takes about three of them to, you know, to stand them up, to get it perfect. But, you know, even from the first one, we may get five aha moments that says, oh, we got to do this. And how do we take that information and then scale it into our existing portfolio very quickly? Uh, so this is all about, this is a learning lab in a way. We're going to learn a lot from this. Uh, it's not going to be done just by building one of them. Uh, there's going to be continuous in improvements or innovation improvements that need to occur, just like with any prototype work that needs to be done. Yeah, that's that's really great. I mean, and it's nice to see you head in this direction. I mean, and I, well, I'm interested in, you know, the challenges you guys are facing or challenges you've sort of come across. You know, typically legacy brands are, not so nimble and it's not a criticism it's just you know the sheer size of the operation so i guess what's your experience here been in terms of shifting the mindset from one that's uh maybe let's see how things go and then and then adjust accordingly to adopting more of an innovative mindset you know the world's way more liquid than it used to be three years ago so i mean how does it go about shifting that mindset within an organization like CKE? Well, a change is always difficult, right? When we're, we're a creature of habits, we like to do the same thing over and over again, but we have to be disruptive in this environment, right? If you're not being disruptive to yourself, guess what somebody's gonna to do to you? So there's gonna be things in there that are kind of um, challenges. You know, technology as an example, right? Our point of sales uh, standardization is so outdated. If we don't have that uh, integrated and fully uh, forward thinking in the 21st century, we can't do any of that stuff, right? We can't even unlock our digital experience from that standpoint even the digital side of it. So there's a lot of these things that are up in the air and not, uh, you know, there, there's always a resistance from some of that, but we need to be uh, mindful of innovation and we need to approach it with thinking is like, you know what, this is a learning opportunity, right? This is about us trying to learn as much as we can. We know that our existing legacy elements are acceptable, but in, in today's environment and forward thinking, it's not. And this will allow us to uh, learn from that as much as we can and then see where it goes. So. As I always say, we got to be disruptive to ourselves first and foremost. Otherwise, you're just catching up to everybody else, and we don't want to be in that position. Right now, we're playing a somewhat of a catch-up role, but ultimately, we want to you know, leapfrog beyond that. If Carl's is all about innovation, we need to get back into the minds of innovation very uh, diligently and very quickly. It doesn't matter if it's the look in the field. doesn't matter if it's food or uh, beverage programs. Whatever might be the case is we need to push those boundaries and expect you know, look at the world differently from from the past on what the future is going to hold. Yeah, and, and you know, the, I, I really like what you say about flexibility. That's one of the things that I know you talk a lot about when restaurants need to move forward into this kind of uncertain period. Well, from what you see or don't see in the restaurant industry in general, do do you think do you think brands are being responsive enough, being flexible enough, and how they're thinking about the future when it comes to adapting for a, a, a new customer of tomorrow? Yeah, no, you know, you can look at COVID as a good and bad thing, right? The good thing that came out of COVID was it actually made everybody think differently and react differently and provide solutions that were relevant, right? So it accelerated a lot of these things. A lot of concepts have been thinking about these things, but they never pulled the trigger. And COVID did that for us, right? And, and even internal within our CKE brand um, from the legacy standpoint, it pushed those boundaries very quickly. So I think 
you know, what came out of that was kind of in light to forward future approach to it and how we provide solutions, uh, especially our state of needs, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, change it as well. So I'm glad in a way that it pushed those boundaries and we need to act and think differently to service our customers in a different manner. Great. And we just, we just have an audience question here that someone sent in uh, before the episode, Bipin, uh, and it has to do with just your realist, your, your portfolio. So uh, have you got any insights then? So I guess, you know, you guys performed really well with drive throughs like you mentioned before, uh, and, you know, in, in malls, they haven't been doing so well, no surprise there. I mean, ha ha with these new prototypes, have you got any insights into how your portfolio might change moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's going to change. We we haven't created the playbook at this time, but absolutely, right? It's like we know, for example, uh, Carl Jr. in California, uh, real estate is the king, right? So it's, it's very expensive to develop. Uh, land cost is expensive. Uh, construction costs are out of control. Everything's out of control. So we got to be nimble in order to stand up these kind of, you know, units that are kind of, you know, satellite units, if you want to call them, or off-premise concepts um, that are relevant. Um, so, yeah, we're looking at a broader way of kind of saying, okay, what are the trade areas, deeper penetration opportunities, so then we could say, okay, this makes more sense. So we're revisiting that entire approach to how our real estate has been kind of looked at from the past, instead of everything being kind of a traditional mindset, right, is now we have a broader way of kind of understanding, like open more units up with a diverse portfolio review. So, uh, really exciting stuff, Pip, and uh, thanks for giving us a bit of an inside look there. Um, we, you know, we, we're just about out of time, actually. These are really just short conversations. But b before you go, Bippin, um, uh, we have another segment that I'm going to throw at you right now. It's called the WTF questions. I haven't told you about this before. I'm sorry to throw you off here, but um, basically, these are just questions that have absolutely no relevance to anything whatsoever. I'm going to give you a minute and a half to answer as many as you possibly can. Are you up for that challenge, Bippin? Well, let's give it a try. Sure, let's give it a try. All right. Your time for the WTF questions starts now. Bippin, question one, what do you prefer, apples or oranges? Apples. Okay. Two, if you could time travel to any year, what year would that be? Oh, my God. Uh, 1979. 1979. Question three, in one sentence or less, why that year? That was the year I came to the United States from India um, at the young age of 10 year old. So it was kind of uh, scary and such. And just to let him know that it's like the future is all right. It'll be fine. Whoa, that's that's that was really cool. I didn't expect that answer. Now, qu question number four. Um, last week we had Julia, uh, Juliana Strife on, who's from Panera, which is your old stomping ground. If Panera and C CKE came together, what would the first menu item be? Oh, I was always a favorite uh, of my, my favorite one. I'm not sure if it's still there or, or not, but it used to be um, rosemary focaccia uh, panini, uh, which I don't think it's there anymore, but that would be the key. Okay, just bringing back an old favorite. Question number five, Bippin. Uh, name this city. This city is famous for a brewery that makes mediocre beer, but has pretty horses on their label. Oh, uh, St. Louis? <laughs> Which is which is your city? I'm sorry for the the city slur. Um, question number six, Bippin. Hardy's or Carl's Jr. You got to pick just one. Go. Carl's. Oh, okay, that was that was really easy. Uh, seven. What what is one good habit you have in your life that you do without fail? Time is up. Well, yeah, do you we're have out a? Time. We're out of time. What what? <laughs> that's the that's the siren which we're trying to we're trying to trying to turn off right now. Uh, great. Bippin, thank you for taking part in your WTF questions. That last question is, do you have a, a good habit you do without fail? You know, I think uh, keep, keep my routine. Okay. You know, that, that's, that's the key to me is that always uh, stay on routine as much as you can and, uh, you know, 80 20 rule at the same time. So, uh, but yeah. What's the 80 20 rule? Well, 80% of the time, you know, you think you, you think you have a day planned out, right? 100% of it, but 20% of it's going to blow you up, right? So as long as you're focused on the 80% of the rule to uh, to meet your, you know, daily needs and all that stuff, that you're okay with that 20% kind of surprises or putting out the fires instead of spending most of your time putting out fires 80% of the time, right? You don't want to do that because you're not going to be successful. So I've never come across that thought before. That's, that's a cool way to look at a day. I don't even think about how my days work. So... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. And Bippin, look, thank you for letting me throw those questions at you. And thanks for just coming on Disrupt uh, in 
in the first place. Um, really great to hear your insights there and also what you have going on at the moment. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. No, that was great. Thanks for having me and I had a great time and uh, we'll see you again uh, in the near future. Yeah, perfect. Actually, we have a live event happening. We're making a return to a live event in, event in October. What do you reckon? Do you think you might be able to come along? Yeah, uh, I'll certainly have it on my schedule right now. We're trying to figure out, you know, when the uh, friend, I think our Hardy's conference is occurring in that time frame. So I got to coordinate that piece. But uh, for now, yeah, pencil me in. Perfect. That's what I like to hear. Um, Bipin Patel, thank you so much for joining us. And, and uh, maybe we'll see you in October. Thanks so much. Well, there you go, guys. That is episode six. And that was Bipin Patel. Thank you so much for joining us today. And like I just said, we are making a return to our live event. Uh, the last time we did a live event was on the very eve of the pandemic starting. And we're coming back in October 17th to the 19th in Palm Springs. We're really, really pumped uh, for this. Our lineup is developing right now. Head to our website. We'll put a link up here on the right hand side of the chat. You can head there, request an invite, see how our lineup is developing. Uh, we have Mark King, Taco Bell CEO on the lineup. He spoke at our last event. He talked about how we can maintain a disruptive attitude and then we headed it into the most disruptive period restaurants have ever experienced. So they've been doing some really cool things, really interesting to, to hear what they've been up to through all of this, uh, but a whole lot of other announcements to make as well. Head to the site, request an invite. And other than that, just as we wrap up right here, uh, episode seven is happening next week, July 1st, same time, same place right here on LinkedIn, 1 p.m. Eastern. And we're going to be uh, with Lee Peterson, uh, who is at WD Partners, which Bippen mentioned in, in our chat just now as well. Lee's a huge favorite of ours uh, and, and with our crowd here at Restaurant Spaces. So uh, we'll be chatting to him next week. Make sure you join us. Can't wait to see you then here on Disrupt. We will see you then. See you later. I'm gonna need you to back up. I'm gonna need you to back up.